Welcome to T-Bone Speaks with Dr. Tarun Agarwal, where our goal is to change the way you practice dentistry by helping you achieve clinical, financial, and personal balance. Now, here's your host, T-Bone. All right, everybody. Uh, Today is going to be the first installment of my Women in Dentistry podcast series. And uh, I think it's Unfortunately, I don't think it's been covered by any of the mainstream dental podcasts, but what we know is that north of 50% of graduating dentists are female, but yet it's to a certain degree a male-dominated world, but we're seeing that change dramatically. As a speaker who's been on the speaking circuit, so I say 10, 15 years now, I've seen a dramatic shift where it was mainly consultants that were in the speaking circuit, and now we're starting to see a significant number of women clinicians and everything. And so the next five or 10 episodes, I really want to kind of focus on everyday women practitioner owners and associates that you should know and and what they can bring to us. So my first guest is someone who I met for the first time uh, last summer in Orlando at an event. It's Dr. Mona Patel, who is the typical Indian that they're all Patels. So that means someone in her family or her husband's family owns a motel. I'm pretty sure of it. But uh, Mona is fantastic. So Mona, uh, what's up? What are you doing? Hi, thanks for having me, T-Bone. Or I should call you T-Bone Uncle because... No, T-Bone Uncle. <laughs> I'm not that old. I'm only six, seven well, years older than you. Well, Come on. I'm still older, so... <laughs> I'm only six years older, not that, that much older. So, all right, Mona, let's dive in, all right? Where are you at? I mean, what what are you doing at your office so late? I'm in my, as you can see, I'm in my office right now, and it's what it's you know seven forty five at it's night. It's eight forty eight forty one Eastern time. Eight forty one Eastern time, and the reason being because this is you know a, a webcam, and you know that viral video that went out of the, of the yeah, program. but that got that guy a lot of attention. You would love that that's, attention, yeah, right? That's my life. So if we did this at home, you'd probably have a lot of. Uh, Little intruders coming in and interrupting and asking me no, questions. So. Uh, perfect. That'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. I would love that. My my kids are dying. My kids want to get on the podcast. And for some reason, I haven't done it with them yet. And uh, yeah. oh, they should. Well, they're, they're so unpredictable, but it's hilarious. So we, I said, you know what? My first podcast with you, I'll play it safe and stay at the office. But maybe next time uh, I'll have them. I'll have the little ones come in. And where is your office? So my office is in a little suburb north of Milwaukee, about five miles north. It's called Whitefish Bay. So, you know, Milwaukee is a, it's a growing population, but there's a lot of great small suburban communities surrounding it. So we're in Whitefish Bay, Wisconsin. Do you live there as well? We, I not quite yet. Eventually, we will be kind of relocating to this area, but we're in downtown Milwaukee right now. Still living the urban life down there. and uh, Urban I, lifestyle with exactly. two kids, with an eight-year-old and a five-year-old? You've got a two girls, eight year old and five year old, Simran and Sienna, who are the loves of our life, but they kind of dictate my whole world. So. Listen, that is total BS, by the way. That the loves of your life, you don't have to, you don't have to pretend on our show, okay? <laughs> but aren't you, isn't that what every parent is supposed to say? No, but I don't. What I tell you is they are, they are going to be the death of me. I'm pretty certain my kids will be the death of me. That's for sure. I'll agree to that. I at least. Once a day, text my husband, hashtag mom of the year, because I've done something wrong or made a mistake or, or forgotten something and, you know, or screamed at a child. So it is, uh, it's all part of, it's all part of all the parenting package. So no, they, they, um, go to school in this area and we're downtown on the east side. Um, but I call, I call Whitefish Bay Pleasantville, USA, because it is, it's like that small town USA feel. Mm. And just, yeah, it was a great. Lots of soccer moms. A lot of soccer moms, a lot of lacrosse moms up here. Hockey moms, probably. Hockey moms, you got everything. And it's, it's literally, in, on my block, there's a there's a bread shop, there's a yoga studio, there's a cute little hair salon. I mean, it's just, it's like going to Disney World and you go to that small town USA. That's what our street yeah, But is. you know all those people are crazy there in small yeah. town USA. They're all hiding something. Yeah, but they all are hiding something. Maybe in the witness protection, who knows? But uh, <laughs> Maybe you're all- in the witness protection. <laughs> We get free bread and cookies, so I'm not complaining. <laughs> All right, so let me ask you some questions. Oh, oh by the way, one last thing. So you have an eight-year-old daughter, Simran, a five-year-old daughter, Siana, and you're married to a physician as well, a prog. So uh, he is an interventional radiologist? Correct. Yeah, he is interventional radiologist, and his his focus in his career is peripheral vascular disease. So he does things like aortic aneurysm. Yeah, I, you've already lost me. 
exactly. But I, isn't, aren't you proud of me? It's pretty well rehearsed that I know actually know what he does. Because so that so means you're a 1960s Indian woman. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. I'm a good Indian wife. I know mm-hmm. I can repeat. So, what he do, does. so do, does he give you a hard time that he's the real doctor and you're not? Oh God! Do you know how many jokes in my family there are that um, you know? What do you call somebody who doesn't get into med school? A dentist? No, no. We, we I call them smart. You know, it's yeah. interesting. So when I married Mona, my Mona, my uh, my wife is also named Mona. When I met her, you know, the typical Indian thing, you go meet their parents, they ask you what you do. And I said, I'm a dentist. And they looked at me like I was like I was stupid. And I said, here's the difference. I will make the same amount of money as you will. And I will work four days a week. And I will work from eight to five. And that'll be it. Yeah. Absolutely. And they looked at me like I was crazy. And then, you're- you know, they say, maybe you're lazy. I said, no, I, I'm just smart. But you know what? And the reality is healthcare is not what it is today as it was in our parents' generation. No, no, not in the 80s. Listen, they were minting money in the 80s, you know, calling the shots, doing what they wanted. Exactly. I mean, my my father's a physician and uh, and then, you know, a lot of siblings, a lot of my family is. So we we talk about this all the time. And my sister and I are the two dentists in the family. And And um, is she older than you? She's older than me. Her name is Mina Goyle. She practices in Chicago. So she's uh, she's got two offices in Chicago. Did she pra- did she start practicing before you? Yes, yeah, she did. She's she's old like you. Is so that <laughs> is that the reason you went into dentistry? That's, yeah, it's a huge reason I went into. How much older is she than you? She's six years older than me. Okay, so when you got out of high school, she was already in dental school. Exactly, and kind of saying, you know, we were always kind of primed to pick a, a career or field that was service oriented. And usually for Indian immigrant parents, it's usually going into medicine. Of course. And, uh, Engineer, and so- medicine, pharmacy, maybe. Exactly. Hey, beta, it's such a good, Betty, it's such a good profession exactly. for women. Exactly. Yeah. You got so, so, well, for no, for women, medicine was not the great profession. No. My dad steered me and my sister away from it. He said, you know, think about what you want in life. And if you want a family and you want to not be doing 10 years of residency and then be 30 before you get married, which is, you know, every Indian parent's worst nightmare to have a 30 year old single daughter. So we, <laughs> we they were like, my parents have a 33 year old single son. So well, there you go. they're probably sweating. So. No, you know, well, I, yeah, they made me ask him a tough question one day and, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, you know, I, I said, listen, you know, it's a different day and age. And my, you know, parents are so weird. My mom's like, I hope I get to see him get married before I die. I'm like, why? Why is everything the death, right? Man, they have one dentist son and one single son. They probably just can't face society right now. Oh no! And my 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 brother is an oral surgeon, so uh, well, I mean, at least he he's got the redeeming quality. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he does. He does. I mean, medicine. It's it, we were kind of exposed to dentistry because my dad was kind of the visionary. He's like, give it, you know, it's a great healthcare field. Any service oriented career is, is noble, and then you do some, you learn a skill, and you you use it for some good. So that was kind of our mentality growing up, and kind of seeing my sister Mina get go through dental school and just be fulfilled, and it was creative, and it seemed like a good career. I'm like, yeah, it looks good. I'm gonna look into it, and I just. You know, how do you know it is as a 20 year old what really your life is going to be like as a dentist, right? You don't know. You shadow some people. and but, that, you- but, but that's part of the beauty of dentistry is that you can be anything you want it to be. You know, my dad told me that dentistry, my dad, I don't want to ever use the word force because he never did. But I, the more I look back, he was like, he, he like, he sent me to dental school without telling me that's what he thinks I should do. And, uh, He always said, listen, I've never met a broke dentist. I've never met an unemployed dentist. And he said, dentistry can be your gateway into anything you want to do. If you want to be a business person, dentistry will provide you capital. You know, you want to be a business person in dentistry, you can own multiple offices. If you want to be a, you know, a family man and and really have a lifestyle, you can work three, four, five days a week in dentistry and have a great family life too. So um, he, he always pushed me towards dentistry. Exactly. And at some point, it's like our parents, they just know they have this, they have this insight and they knew. And we, I mean, me and my sister, we got very lucky. You know, my, my brother, he became a physician and we tease him all the time. Is he older than both of you? He's he's the baby. No, he's the younger one. And, um, and we talk, it's like, it's just not, medicine's not the same anymore. And we have so much control 
in dentistry. One of them being like, you know, I just built a brand new office and it is everything from paint to furniture to philosophy we get to control. But my husband, he's, you know, works in a a hospital environment and he's like, I'll never get to kind of. Oh, he smells like Clorox in there. Yeah, exactly. He's like, I'll never in my place of work or where I've established my career and teaching that he'll be able to uh, design an aesthetic that reflects his personality. So somewhere he loves going and doesn't mind hanging out till at eight o'clock at night, you know? Exactly. Exactly. And so you're at the mercy of, you know, hospital systems are so corporate. And so there's so much unpredictability there, but it's, I think it's nice knowing dentistry that there's still a lot of control that we have as dentists, as clinicians, especially if you own your own practice. And, and that's, it's a great feeling. Again, at 20, I didn't know, I, you don't think about this. You just think I'll be a dentist. I'll, you know, get to wear a white coat and, uh, and practice. <laughs> and do you wear a white coat even? I do. I oh, wear, well, I don't. I wear jeans to work. You wear, well, you know, you wear jeans in your polo. I hope you don't wear that orange hat to work because I've been seeing it. Oh, no, no, no. I only, that, that orange hat is, is uh, number one, okay? First okay. and foremost, I think it's beautiful, okay? And number two, my mom handmade that for me, okay? That's- only reason you're allowed to wear it is if you had somebody you love make it for you because yeah. I was looking at it and I'm like, okay, he's either being sponsored by like Orange Theory or somebody. <laughs> something's going on. I couldn't be that lucky to have any sponsors. Nobody's willing to sponsor me. I can't even get my wife to sponsor me for God's sakes. <laughs> and speaking of sponsors, listen to this. One of my team members I just hired probably two months ago is a Canadian and I didn't realize she was here on a student visa and she's just getting deported. Oh no! <laughs> well, you better. Well, we ha- you know what? She might be lucky. We might all be moving to Canada one day. <laughs> I am not. Listen, let me tell you. Regardless of political inclination, I still think this is the greatest country in the world with the greatest opportunity in the world. And what makes this country great is how resilient they are. Because we've had some bozos in office and in politics, and look how great our country still is. We we oh, it's we do we do well despite our government. No, you're absolutely right. And, you know, and, and you and I are, are similar in that. We you know we're immigrant children. We're first generation Indians. Our parents came here. So I, I was born in India, just so you know. You, so was I. Okay. How, how old were you when you moved here? I was a baby, though. I was six months old. I was so. two years. So I lived in India much longer than you, okay? Yeah. Okay. So I'm, and, and I am still an Indian citizen. Oh, well, that, that, that I'm not. So mm. you can, no, you're smart. You're, I, I, you should I see the know. lines I have to go through to, to get back into this country. If it's I unbelievable. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's, you know, but it's worth it. It's, it, uh, it's still the place where you can build the American dream. And, you know, I, I know that your, your, your father built the hotels and made it. Motels, way up. cockroach motels, cockroach motels. Mot- cockroach motels, but then yeah. you can't work your way up. Yeah. And I think it's a great, I think it's a great place. I was, um, recently at IDS in Germany. And it was my first time going to an international dental conference, and and it was overwhelming. It's amazing. it's different, isn't it? Oh, it's different, and it's huge. It's like ten times the size of midwinter meeting. So it it was just uh, an eye opener as to how small Amer- the American dental market is. But every, I I just got the feeling though that a lot of the their advancements and their teachings and like kind of the things that they're showing is is targeted towards American dentists. Well, our, our market drives the economy exactly. of dental companies. It really does. I mean, there's there's. 25 different ovens for glazing, uh, a stain and glazing, you know, that even though we're really kind of the only in the American market, we kind of only see a few options. But when we when you're there, it's, there's so many varieties out there that we don't get to see. But yet the U.S. dentist opinion and um, kind of what uh, our take on these products is what drives their sales. Well, our, bu- our buying patterns, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so it was it was just crazy to see that. But I got to See there, and I talked to a lot of German dentists that practice there in Cologne, and they have a lot of struggles there. I mean, they they build these beautiful offices and very modern, very sleek. They put a lot of time and effort and, and um, thought into smart design, and they'll do that. But the way that their practices are government regulated, it was one dentist was telling me they make they build ninety dollars for a root canal, ninety U.S. dollars is the equivalent for their root canal in Germany. In Germany, it's all fixed, it's all regulated. So it's like it's it's not a very capitalistic mentality, and uh, and every basically every German dentist bills the same and collects the same there, and so it's weird. It's a dichotomy to see kind of how we do that here in the U.S. And you can see five different dental offices on one block, 
and they're all, they have very different philosophies and, and fee schedules and um, design aesthetics and things like that. Uh, but that's not so much in Europe. I mean, it's very regulated there. So I still think America is kind of is the best place to be a small business entrepreneur dentist who wants to have it all. You know, what's interesting about IDS is it's a total show. It's not, there's not an ounce of education there. There's no CE there. I didn't learn anything, but I definitely saw a lot. I, I, well, the one thing I did learn was that there's a bar in every booth. Isn't that yes. Good? Yeah, they have- well, IDS is the biggest show in dentistry. But you know, interesting, right after IDS, I didn't go to IDS. Uh, I needed a weekend off, but uh, I went to take a CERC anterior course from Joseph Kunkula in uh, the Czech Republic. So it was eye-opening for me to see how education is very different in Europe and how uh, we had a very international crowd uh, as part of our class. I mean, it was a small group, but... Uh, it was interesting. Like I met a couple of dentists from Peru and Croatia and they were telling me that dentists, you know, we talk about, Hey, which associate should I take right out of school? And these guys are like, okay, I think I'm going to, I want to work in this place. I'll be an assistant there until a dentist job opens up. And, and uh, it's, it's interesting how little by our standards, the dentists make there, um, how little the fees are, but yet um, I see some of the work they do and it's, Oh my God. It's a very different mentality in terms of the dentistry that they're doing. And, and they, they, you know, they really view American dentistry as a greed driven business, which quite frankly it is. And that, that I'm okay with that. No, no. And I a hundred percent agree there. You know, the dentists, they go to work, they kind of clock in, clock out. Uh, they, uh, they're there. It's like I said, it's all government regulated. So they're okay with capping out their income and there's, it's not very capitalistic at all. But um, but I do I do think that they do admire the American dentist for kind of our creativity and our and I mean, I know the industries in Europe at IDS, at least were really like the American dentist because we buy everything. So <laughs> they, they, they love that mentality. <laughs> but so, it was an eye-opening experience to be out there at IDS and kind of see how other countries and other um, international dentists, what their struggles are and what they are good at and kind of comparing it to what we face here in the U.S. I still still think though I would I would build an office here in the US again over and over again. What, what would you tell your daughters about dentistry when they get of that age? Well, I, my my five year old's already told me she's offering to buy my practice, my new beautiful practice for three dollars. In, Indian mentality would be that you would give your practice to your kids. Okay? Yeah, yep. And I go, okay for three dollars I go, I told Parag I need a plan B for retirement. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely not the sale of this practice, but no, I mean, I would tell them that, um, I mean, I think I, I know in 20, 25, 30 years, dentistry is going to evolve even more, but I, I'm optimistic. I think it's going to evolve for the better. And, um, there'll be more of a fusion of more technology integrated into our practice. And I think I would tell them it's, it's a great field. I'm fulfilled. I walk into my office every day with a smile on my face, and I leave every day with a smile on my face. And you know, they, yeah. They, now you something. know that's a lie. There's no way you leave no. every day with a smile in your in I your face. I do. I honestly do. Maybe because I'm I, I just we, I'm living in my dream. What I, psychiatric I, drugs are you taking? <laughs> A, we leave the nitrous tanks on high in my office. <laughs> Maybe that contributes to it. But you know what I mean, metaphorically, in that I love doing what we get to do. And we all know after 10 years of doing this, some you know, some parts of dentistry get boring or boring or you're not stimulated, you're not challenged, and it's definitely taxing on you physically. So there are parts of it that aren't great, but in general, I think it's a great field, especially for women. All right. So let's talk about 10 years. So you graduated dental school in 2007. Yeah. Where'd you graduate dental school from? The you Vietnam? Were, yeah, Vietnam. I got it online, $39. And yeah. Oh, you're, it's a top dental graduate award. <laughs> Buy our plaque and we'll send this you to you. You got it. You got it. No, no. it all says, where'd you graduate dental school? I graduated from University of Illinois in Chicago. So okay, UIC. Day. UIC. Um, and it was a yeah, great program because it was the only, at the time, the only dental school in the Chicago area. So we, we got to see a lot and do a lot of rotations. And so graduated there and then went to uh, Miami for an AEGD for one year. Where at Miami? Um, it's, it was affiliated with Jackson Memorial Hospital. It's, it was a, a small AEGD clinic called Community Smiles. Okay. And it was great. So they treated the indigent population in Miami. We would have you know, a line out the door at 7 a.m. and our residency program would start oh, every morning. It was a denture clinic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but it was, denture was only one day. And then we had 
ortho one day a month, endo a couple days a month, implants. I placed like probably a dozen implants in my AGD that year. So all the volunteer dentists in the area would come in and teach us and we would treat the population there and they'd just be waiting um, all day to get in and we would have designated days every month for different aspects of general dentistry. So Why'd you do a residency? You know, it was, uh, in hindsight, I'm glad I did it. I wish I could say that I was really eager to continue my education. For me, it was more of a practical, logistical situation. Uh, Parag, my husband, was doing Were you already married when you got out of dental school? I was already married when I got out of dental school, and he matched in Miami at the Cardiac and Vascular Institute for his fellowship year. So I didn't want to take the Florida boards and just to practice for one year. So I said, you know what, I'm going to take this year. We didn't have kids yet. I knew he was going to be working 20 hours a day. So I was like, I'm going to take this year to do an AEGD. And it was an unpaid residency, but it was the best decision I ever did because I really sharpened up those clinical skills. But at the time, it was just a, hey, I well, need to but, kill but when you say sharpened up, okay, <laughs> do you really mean that? Yeah. Like, retrospectively, do you think that made you a better clinician or they – the, the the things you do today were as a direct result of that GPA. Because I'm like, I'm hiring a new associate this summer and he's a fresh graduate. And it's like talking to him kind of brought back all my memories. When you're, when you graduate dental school, the day of graduation, you are probably the smartest you'll ever be, but you don't know a damn thing yet. You know, well, I think you're the dumb, you're dumb. Yeah. Well, I know I'm saying you're clear. Not you, but uh, de- <laughs> you know, graduates. You're incredibly book smart. You know, you know, tripod occlusion like none other, but you don't know anything yet. And so I could have started working and I would have learned, I think, any first year out, whether it's corporate office, your own office, an associate, um, you know, a residency, your first year out is another training year, no matter what environment you're put in. So for me, I, we were, I mean, I did 20 ortho cases that year. I did, I can't even count how many endos. It just was like one after another after another and you had great teachers teaching you. So yes, absolutely. That really made me feel comfortable about my clinical skills. So when I took my first job, it wasn't, I wasn't nervous trying to diagnose, you know, root pathology. Whereas when it's your first job out or right out of dental school, you're going to second guess that. All right. So what did you do after you, 2008, you did your eight, you finished your AGD in Miami, uh, South beach on the beach, uh, in your, your high rise luxury condo. From your unpaid residency. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you how high rise that was. <laughs> but um, yeah, we were down there for one year and then it was time to, you know, have a grown up life and get some real jobs. So we moved, we settled in Milwaukee. You know, my. So now my, your husband choose, you choose? He, he was a driving force because okay. we're from Chicago, from the Chicago a- area. And so we were, we were kind of looking back to settle in the Midwest. Is that and, pretty common for. So this is where I, I, I'm, I'm very afraid that I, I'm going to become sexist and get in trouble, okay? And so I'm asking some of these questions uh, from a, is it is it not unusual for the, as a women dentist, to be told where to go based on your husband as primary? Well, you know, it depends on where you are in your life, okay? Okay, and I and it doesn't need, doesn't need to be Indian or American or what. I think when in our generation, this day and age, I mean, he was finishing a fellowship year and his his field is very it was a very niche field. And he was looking at a, a like a program directorship position at a huge academic hospital that kind of narrowed the field. So, I mean, there's like it. five or ten places in the country. Yeah, maybe. I mean, you know, there's five or ten places that would kind of fulfill that. And I mean, I set the parameters. I'm the one who said I want to be in the Midwest. I want to have a family. I want to be close to our family. So, yeah, I mean, I think if we're playing like kind of gender norms, maybe, I think women maybe can dictate parameters of being where if you want to start a family. But I think oftentimes, yeah, I, um, the the primary bread earner, quote unquote, or the... Yeah, but I don't think that's the situation in your, your case necessarily, okay? Not necessarily, but you know what? I wasn't this business owner, you know, private practice owner 10 years ago. I was, had just finished my degree and we were starting our family right then. So my primary goal, my primary focus was, hey, regardless of whatever job I'm going to take, it's going to be secondary to me having my first child right now. And so, so you want, you knew that you wanted to do a job. Yes. Yes. So I knew and I knew I said the first few years. He, he's establishing it. I wanted to be incredibly supportive. And so I was like, okay, let's, M- Milwaukee sounds great. Let's settle there. It's only an hour from all of our family in Chicago. 
And, you know, there's a lot less traffic, so I, I was all up for it. And we said, we'll give it five years. And, um, I, you know, maybe every, every relationship is different, but it's really important to me. I think to have your partner or your spouse be incredibly professionally fulfilled, it just makes them happier people. Well, and it makes you happier at life and at home. Life and happier people tend to empty the dishwasher more often and throw out the garbage. <laughs> wait, wait is life. that why I don't empty the... <laughs> you help out at home more so i was like let's make sure he's very professionally fulfilled so he is happier at home <laughs> oh god i'm my my poor my poor mona <laughs> no your poor mona oh goodness i don't even want to know but no we we it was a mutual decision but i kind of set the parameters and so we moved here to milwaukee most due to his career driving force but i was fine with it because it was an hour away but also in my i mean maybe it was a little and my situation was different. I moved here uh, pregnant with our first child. So my mindset wasn't, I want to build my dream practice right now, or I want to start placing in. Was that even, was that even in your mind then? Yes, it was. It was in my mind. Maybe one day it was a maybe one day. But so it wasn't, day. it wasn't like a definitive, yes, I'm going to do this. No. no, I always thought I was content. Honestly, to be honest, eight, eight years ago, seven years ago, I was content being a dentist because I thought I could, you know, have a career and make a difference, but I wanted to be a mom. What are you, millennial? You want to make a difference? <laughs> exactly. Make a difference and get paid for it while you're making yeah. that difference. <laughs> yeah. And do the, den do the, do the good dentistry while the, the owner doctor does the restorative dentistry. Exactly. Exactly. I thought I'd come in and do these huge cases and yeah. then, um, you know, still be at ballet by three o'clock for my daughter. So, um, I, I, it was never, I never valued the importance of wanting to buy my own practice back then i just wanted to practice like be a dentist and so i did i joined a corporate environment okay and define corporate environment for me from corporate your eyes it was corporate environment is where it's not um you know single or two or three partner owned they have multiple offices this office you know forward dental had uh, over 30 offices and okay. you, you get hired was the, was the owner on site for you no, they're the owner. No, it was not the owner. Outside. It, was, it was like a shareholder. Okay. It so it's fact. true corporate dentistry. True corporate. It's, you know, it, it falls into the uh, Aspen Dental uh, categories or Midwest Dental, Heartland, those types. So true but, okay. cor corporate dentistry where there's, you know, you have a management aspect to them and then the owners are sh uh, shareholders. And so you're strictly an employee of this group. And you have no say in any of the policy making or the policy. running of the practice, but you go in and you basically see your patients and leave. Okay. And how long were you there at Forward Dental? I was there five years. Five years. Yeah, You're I like a dream associate for five yeah, years. I, yeah, I was the dream associate because I was there five years because in those five years I had two children. And so every other year I was well, how, well, how much were you working? So I was working, um, you know, I started out full time five days a week. And then after the first maternity leave, went back to four days. And after the second maternity leave, went back to three days. And they were cool with it. They were cool with it. They were, you know what, I think sometimes corporate dentistry gets a bad rap. Um, but there are a lot of benefits to it. I think they feed on that, to be quite honest with you. Yeah, maybe because they do. Because yeah. so let me can I ask you this then? So would you say that maybe you didn't look for private practice associateships because of that reason? Because of what reason? That hey, I, I you know I'm gonna have a kid. I might go to five days, four days, three days. Yeah, I wanted the flexible. I didn't. I was. I was no way that I wanted to invest in a private practice with two little kids at home. No, but I'm saying even work for say work for someone like me, not me personally, yeah. but like yeah. a private practice owner and be yeah. an associate in a in a true private practice. I hundred percent went into corporate dentistry because I didn't want to screw over an owner because I knew I would be on maternity leave and I wanted to work part time and things like that. So I thought, you know, at least for a few years until we settle and I figure out what area, what I want, really want to do with my career. Let me work in a corporate environment where if I'm, if I'm coming and going a little bit throughout a year, it's not going to affect the practice as much. You know, I, I equate that to uh, my mom's job as a teacher. Uh, so my mom was, she had a master's in psychology in India and came back here. And I think, I want to say, was it ninth grade or 10th grade? When I was in ninth grade or 10th grade, my mom went back to college to get her teacher certificate. And she got a, I, I want to say it was like eighth and eighth and ninth grade. And uh, so my mom went back and she, she commuted 45 minutes each way every day. Uh, to go to to go to college to get a teaching certificate, and you know, uh, you know, to a certain degree, I said, "Why are you doing this?" She goes, "Well, 
you know, I want to have flexibility. Teaching is a good job. At the end of the day, you know, it's eight to f- eight to three, whatever it is. And, you know, I have the flexibility. I have to work. I don't have to work. It's, you know, that kind of thing. So how much did your husband's job or his being a professional himself uh, play into your decision making on what you did out, out of dental school? Oh, a huge, a huge part. And I think, you know, I- I mean, where I'm as progressive female as you get, but there's still, I'm still, I made the decision to be a wife and to be a mom. And for me, I, those are incredibly wholesome roles that I, I wanted to play. And so when do I get one of those? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You have a Mona already. (laughs) But I wanted to be able to, you know, keep a, a fun, happy home. And I wanted to be there for my children as much as I could. And I think in this day and age, it's it's so hard for women to get away with saying that without being tagged as not career driven then. And it's such a fine balance because it's a, I can't, I think stay at home moms are sometimes looked upon as like, they're not as driven. And I'm jealous. Are you kidding yeah. me? Far from the, uh, the but they work I, hard, by the way. When I was a stay-at-home mom, it's harder than being in, at work because it's a thankless job, and it is. And it's, there's so much going on, and you don't get the um, acknowledgement for it because I think too often times it's like, what do you bring into the household dictates kind of how much appreciation you get. So, um, you know, I mean, supporting my husband and his the first five, six years of his career in establishing the new, um, you know, the IR residency program or getting that going at his hospital, that was incredibly time consuming for him. He was, even if he wasn't on call, he was in the hospital on most weekends. And, you know, he he went from working 60, 70, 80 hours a week, the first five years that we had um, moved to Milwaukee. And I was incredibly supportive. Yes, it takes its toll. It takes a toll on a marriage and it takes its toll on me feeling like, okay, now there was a point a few years in where I was like, okay, I want to do more. It's my, my turn. turn. It's my turn. Yeah. It's my turn. And so that's kind of where the pendulum shifted about five years in, four years in where I, you know, I had two kids and, and I was with them for the first few years. And by saying with them, I've always worked, but working three days, corporate dentistry is a lot more flexible than. Oh, I mean, you literally, you know, you, to a certain <laughs> degree, you punch in, you punch out, you don't exactly. have business, you know, you don't have to work on your practice. It's literally a job. I worked 28 hours a week, and I literally work 28 hours a week. Right now, no. my clinical practice is <laughs> two hours a week. I work 24 <laughs> seven. Right yeah, now. it seems like it. All right, so let's back back to this uh, this thing. Okay, so what we well, okay? So while you're in corporate dentistry, which I think is a terrible name, but that's irrelevant. Okay, because we all are, like my practice is corporate dentistry because I'm a corporation too, but um, as are you. Um, Big box dentistry. <laughs> yeah, so th- that's fair. So let me ask you this: um, How driven were you in this first five years? Were you taking a lot of CE? Were you learning a lot of stuff, or were you just doing whatever your practice need, whatever the your where you were working needed? Well, you know, at the time, I thought it was pretty driven because I was like, "Oh, I'm going to the CE. I'm doing this." But again, when you're when you're an employee in a large group practice, you can't dictate certain things. I didn't even take any. CEREC or CAD CAM classes because we couldn't implement it into our practice. Um, the general dentist can't place the implants in that group. So that's why I kind of let that fizzle away. I came off on such a high from my residency placing implants and then I didn't touch it for five years. So it, um, I, I driven at the time to do CE and do, but it was, it was very restorative dentistry driven, the, the bread and butter of dentistry. Like, so you know, give I, me some examples of the types of CE you were taking then. Okay. And do you look back and say, I should have taken different and more CEs? No, no. I, I think those are building blocks to, you know, when you're, you're, you're more comfortable into clinical practice. So, you know, the first couple of years are how to di- to adequately diagnose uh, endoperio lesions. or um, They have classes so- like that? Yeah, they do. They <laughs> they, do. they have classes. Like I that. skipped all of those. Well, we're mastering anterior um, aesthetics, and this is not you know full anterior restoration. This is like mastering your anterior resin. Like a class and, three that you can't see. But, yeah, or you know managing pediatric patients. Oh right? God, help me. So, but at the time I thought, oh, I'm learning, but and it's all things you needed to know, but they were very baseline foundational skills, which there's nothing wrong in doing that. You Did you to, know any better? No, I didn't know any better. Absolutely not. I didn't know any better. And I was sheltered from a lot that's out there. And but no that was because of that. your job to a certain degree? 
yeah, I think it was because of the job and also because I don't think I was as aggressive in going out there to learn or see. And even though my sister was in private practice, I mean, I talked to her every day. She would be telling me things that she's doing or implementing or, you know, she's uh, she did. She was going out to Scottsdale for Spears three or four times a year and telling me all that. And I would say, yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, because my, my priorities were different and they were more focused, very focused on being at home. And I was more focused on, you know, getting at home, getting home to an 18 month old. And, and I didn't travel as much and things like that, but that was my conscious decision. But then it's amazing. It just, there's no aha moment that it just, I woke up and I said, I'm, this is not for me anymore, but you kind of start feeling bored and you start feeling unfulfilled. And then and that's what kind of drove then the decision to pursue my own small private practice. It kind so of, this would be like 2013 then? This is 2013 when okay. I, you know, placed my last amalgam before I just amalgams. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like you, you have to follow what the, you know, because in the if for dental at least insurance covers amalgams and there's an upcharge for residents. So majority of the patient population they're paying for the amalgams, and so I had to do it, even though I hated it. And you, you just come home. I came home one day. I'm like, okay, I'm done. I don't want to. Well, I can't. I know I, I don't want to do this, but I'm practicing. I'm doing something that I don't believe in and I have to do it. And I'm doing it, what, for a paycheck? So I said, this is not right. And so I, I learned a lot from that. You know, I don't want to bash them. I, I did learn a lot, but I wasn't building any real long lasting patient relationships. You only and, learned what you what you thought you were. You learned your ceiling was very low. Exactly. My ceiling was low. My priorities were different, but my professional um, fulfillment was, I didn't realize was so low. I, I just, it, it wasn't a priority, but then you start, you start evolving a little bit. And so I had, you know, very candid, long couple months conversations with Prague. I was like, okay, time. No man wants to talk for a couple of months. No, I, oh, he, he, poor guy. I like nag him to death. He calls his Bose noise canceling headphones. He calls us Mona canceling headphones. <laughs> I, wait, 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 Mona. I'm writing this down for my Mona, Mona canceling headphones. He puts them on and turns on the switch and he's like, Oh, can't hear you. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I gotta meet this if, character. If you don't know this about me by now, I like to talk everything out. So, yeah. <laughs> poor guy. But we had a we had a very open conversation. I told him, listen, we've been together what ten years. I, I need to be professionally fulfilled, you know, and 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 your career is incredibly demanding. But he was, hey, I was, I'm very lucky. I mean, he was incredibly supportive, and I was like, okay, well, let's do it. Look, you tell me what I need to cut back on, and and whatever, let's make this work. And but so, however supportive he is, okay, and I'm supportive to my wife to a certain degree as well. But incredibly driven men, we're selfish in that at the end of the day, it's really about us. Well, you know, but incredibly intelligent wives know that at the end of the day, you keep think you keep letting them think it's about them, but really you're getting your way. So is that what's happening to me? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. You, I mean, I, I learned early on. I mean, I, he, he still, he still, you know, thinks he's runs the family show, but you know, the reality. Oh, I don't run the family show. I run nothing. I run the business show. That that's the, I run my practice and I run her practice pretty much. And, and that's pretty much it. And even that I'm not even involved in her practice as much. They've kicked me out of that too. But you know what? But I mean, what husband is not going to say, yeah, sure. You want to go buy a practice. You're going to, I mean, yeah, it's going to take a lot of work and you'll be away from the family a little bit, but it's one, again, he recognized it too. He's like, you'll be happier because you're doing something that you love. And at the end, it's going to be a better financial reward for the family. So I don't think, I think he saw it as a win-win, but uh, I mean, of course, there's the Indian in him. That's the Patel in him. There's a Patel in him. <laughs> yeah. you know, and I was like, okay, well, something's got to give because you can't be, you know, have everything in place and, and juggle everything well all the time. So, but you know that those are superficial things. Like, yeah, he poor guy probably eats yogurt and granola more often for dinner than I like to admit to my mom. But it's, <laughs> it's the reality of it. Betty, you must take care of him. Exactly. Bichara. Bichara gets doesn't get fed. I'm like, your son is just fine. <laughs> so, all right. So, 2013. You decide to leave your job and you're going to start private practice. Did you buy something? Did you go from scratch? Yeah. What'd you do? 
So we, in, to make it a long story very short, I, you know, looked around quite a bit, um, but I, I thought I wanted kind of shared ownership, but an opportunity for a, a complete 100% buyout was in play. And it was in Whitefish Bay. It was a great practice, been around for 30 plus years, um, out, outdated old, you know, building, renting in an old building and an older practice. But, you know, it's, it had a great patient uh, population. And so it was kind of ideal for me. It was small. It was cute. It wasn't overwhelming. And um, it was uh, he wanted to do a 100% ownership transfer, but wanted to stay on for a couple of years. Even better. Yeah. And so that for me was like, that is a complete win-win because I don't have to share ownership. I can own it right out, but I have him around to help transition me into some things. Now, if you don't mind me asking, um, uh, how much was the practice doing and what was, how, much did you, how much did you buy it for? So the practice, he built a bureau, and it was his private practice for 30 years. He, when I, the last two, three years average of what I was looking at when I was doing my valuation, he was doing about, um, clearing like right at a million. Okay. So right? he was, he was collecting about a million dollars. So you, about a million dollars so you probably bought it for six, 700. Yeah, pretty close. Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, right under seven. Okay. So, um, and this is based on a really good friend of mine. His name is Andy Lemkul with Edge Advisors. He is a, like a, a dental broker per se, but he did the full valuations and, you know, all the numbers. You have to have your attorney and your accountant sure. and everything to look at it, but it all lined up. And so we, we financed it and I uh, bought the practice. And, you know, November 30th, he owned it. December 1st, I owned it. And it was simple as that. And, you know, I inherited the staff and that was the team. Kind of staff is an infection. <laughs> I inherited the team and uh, they may not have been a team, but they are a team. Yeah, no, absolutely. They, they definitely run my life here. <laughs> um, they kind of inherited them. And I think everyone was a little nervous because he was, you know, how big was this office? Um, physically. Yeah. Physically. Oh, like 15, 1600 square feet. How many operatories do they have? Three ops, three dental ops, two hygiene ops, five ops um, in that small of a space. Yeah, it was like, yeah, like about 1,600 square feet, and it wasn't big So how did you guys share both of you then? Well, he, you know, we alternated. We went there very, to over, we overlapped a lot. It didn't overlap a lot, I'm sorry. And um, he started, he was only there about a day, day and a half a week. Okay. And so we went there together very much, and we, the, the front office team was amazing at scheduling kind of the, the diehard patients. For that, him, yeah. Yeah, for him scheduling them when we were both there so that I could do the hygiene check and he introduced me. And I, and I give him credit because what kind of his philosophy and what he was telling all of his patients is, hey, listen, I'm retiring soon, not now, soon. And I'm not going to be around here forever, but I've picked your next dentist for yeah. you. You don't have to do that job. I have picked her for you and she's here and she's awesome. So it really helped to have that endorsement. Of course. This is a very, um, Whitefish Bay is a, a, just a very affluent community, um, a very big Jewish population. And, you know, Bill Tiberian. What does was, affluent and Jewish have to do with this? <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about this no, don't go there. Don't go there. Yeah, let's let's move. Ready. Just glaze right over it, okay? Just saying, he, he's Bill Tiberian. He was, he is a, you know, an older Jewish gentleman, and his patients really connected with him because he, a lot of them threw his uh, religious affiliations and things like that. And then the JCC. Yeah, the JC, exactly, the JCC. And then here comes me, you know, the Indian lady who was, you know, this bubbly Indian lady that comes in. And I was like, you know, take takes them a little bit to kind of trust in me that I know what I'm talking about sometimes. <laughs> so, was it daunting to own this practice? Yes, absolutely. It was, I, I knew I had a lot ahead of me, but I didn't realize how much brain power it really takes. And your husband being physician... Did he help or was it helpful in any way? Did he have any, it sounds like he does, he's not in a private practice environment or a business ownership environment. So he can't really necessarily bring any of that to the table. No, I mean, he doesn't look at P&L sheets every month with an accountant. He doesn't have to worry about overhead and things like that. He did help and, you know, he, he does, he's in a big leadership role. So he did talk to me about how we need to set examples as leaders, but working with our team and, and um, how we have to look at everything from every angle before we make a decision and things like that. But definitely not from the accounting perspective. I kind of really relied on my sister a lot for that. She helped me out a ton uh, with kind of her successes and failures in her own businesses and her own practices. So that give, helped. A lot. Give us some some examples of failures. Um, 
let's see, like. No, I'm not talking about yours, not hers. We don't want to air her dirty laundry. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, in the very beginning, like I didn't have a, a good bonus structure set up, so I. But just okay, like, oh, but gonna... isn't the bonus structure one of the hardest things to do in dentistry? And I think it is, and I thought, I thought. Hey, I'm doing a great job. I'm going to give a bonus if we meet a certain number. And it's funny how it's, it's the perception comes sometimes can be so different from your team and the way you present it because I think that maybe sometimes they feel entitled to it, but you then you get offended that they're feeling entitled to it because it should be a bonus. And then so I may have like undermined it in the beginning, and and it kind of rubbed everybody the wrong way. And did you like, did your previous owner have a bonus system in place? He did. He did. And I... You didn't just he, inherit it and do the same thing? I didn't do the same because it was so complex. It was It was just like, oh, if you fill the second column for emergency... Oh, God, help me. Schedule, <laughs> ...then you do 15% of that. And it just... It was so... It was so much mind fodder I didn't need. I just said, okay, let's... If we meet a certain goal every month, then everybody gets this bonus. And um, so things like that. And I think that I... I let's see, what else? Like, you know, over-ordering or under-ordering or... Or I, I kind of set an example, or I kind of set a mandate in my office. I ask everyone, everyone on the team, leave your emotional baggage at the door when you walk in in the day. Like, I know everybody has stuff going on, but when we're here, we have to be like our best versions of ourselves for our patients' stuff because they can see, patients can see through tension and stuff like that with the staff and with our, all of us. And so um, there are days where I probably didn't, I didn't reflect that and I would be cranky about something and they take it so personally. So little things like that, you I mean, I've, what else? I not luckily I had I had the former owner there with me as associate, so you know larger cases and stuff that he had started. I was inheriting that that those went smoothly. Okay. But, you know, we were it was a it was a great practice. But what's it, was, it like working with all women? Or I assume you're working with all women. Yep. Ninety five percent of dental employees are women. Yep. Yep. No, I work with all women and. It's great. I think they, um, you have to, I don't know, women are either usually very supportive of each other or they're really like catty and don't like each other. You haven't had any catty people? I've had some. I've had some catty people. But really, I, I went into this, one of my biggest things, I went into this trying to be as humble as possible and say, I need you guys and we're going to be in this together. And I think that helped rub them the right way. And that, you know, for the past four years, they've been uh, very, very supportive of me. And I, I don't know, maybe the, they didn't have as much luck with the former owner that way. But I mean, I, they, everyone that gets catty, everyone gets catty. And I think it was hard for them to see. Um, I'm significantly younger than a lot of them. And maybe, they, but they've never made me feel like I'm any, you know, I, I know any less or anything like that. But they've always, they're very respectful, very respectful. So no, yeah, women can be catty, but they don't show it to me here. Okay. Which is great, but I, but I also ask. I say, you know, everyone kind of leave your emotional issues at the door, and and let's just do the best dentistry we can. But I also say, come and talk to me. I can't read people's. I can't read everybody's minds. If you don't like something or didn't like a bonus or something, come and talk to me about it because I'm learning as I go too. I think, and if we're that, if we're transparent, if we're really transparent with our team and and kind of be come across it, not come across, but actually are very humble. It's it's amazing how accepting they can be of a new owner then but if you come in thinking i'm the new dentist i'm the new owner i'm the boss my i know better i know better i'm your boss i write your paycheck like i how many times have i heard that from people really i would never say that to people oh my gosh i've heard that from other dentists that are hell they write my paycheck exactly well that's see that's the thing but you you acknowledge that and you're humble but i hear that and i said that's not gonna win you any favors with your team but no the transition was actually very smooth the okay. transition with patients was smooth but the, the facility was incredibly outdated and you know I like techie I like gadgety I like everything I like things to look pretty and it, it didn't feel that way so when I had new family and friends coming in to see the office and I was like yeah ignore you know this 30 year old chair that ignore green. 90% of my office Ignore ninety five percent of my office. Let me show you my pretty new Sarek that's tucked in the corner. Let me let me focus you on that. So okay, so yeah. I want to talk about two last things. Okay, well, actually, two main. I want to make sure I get through two things, and we can talk as much as you want. I I I I have met somebody who likes to talk more than me, apparently, and you, but <laughs> that, that's okay. Um, all right. So okay, so when you bought this place, it was a bit outdated. Zero technology, essentially. Um, no, there was, I mean, there was, they had electronic charting and. Okay. That is, that is not even technology anymore. Okay. 
and digital. Wait, what are you going to have, an abacus? <laughs> hey, I have a calculator. I have technology. <laughs> Let me open my appointment book to schedule <laughs> Hey, I have whiteout instead of an eraser now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was uh, the sensors were updated. But uh, so, yeah. tell me about the real quick. Tell me about the practice. I forgot to ask this. Are okay. you an insurance driven practice? Do you take PPOs? What is your yeah. scenario? We are. I am um, premier provider with Delta Dental. That's the only. So, so okay. So I got into this with Giuliani. Um, yeah. Are you a fee for service practice? I'm a fee for service practice. Yes, but we take insurance. So I know that it doesn't make. But sense. Delta, your PPO practice is you take Delta. Yeah, we take Delta is the only one that I take. But you're I contracted, take. right? Yes, I'm contracted with okay. Delta. Okay, because because Giuliani tried to tell me that, hey, listen, I'm a fee for service practice. I'm like, dude, you take two PPOs, and those PPOs, he's by his own admission, represent forty five percent of his practice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like you have PPO practice. Yeah, so okay. what Delta represents? What percentage of your practice? Delta represents about twenty percent of my practice. So so you're twenty percent PPO. Yes. And I know Delta has Premier, Delta has PPO, but whatever. To me, it's PPO, your contract, your preferred, your preferred provider, okay? Yeah. So you're contracted. And the 80% of your patients pay you your full fee. Pay me my full fee, exactly. And, and you, we, But you accept assignment? Uh, yes. Okay. So if I walk in and I have MetLife, for example, yes. Yes. Uh, you'll take my 50%. Yes. Yeah, so we will take your 50% and we say we will bill it out. Um, and then whatever they come back with, Covering you will let you know what your difference is at that okay. time. Why would let me ask you this? Why wouldn't you just say like because in that scenario, my guess is you always have to collect money from people, right? Yes, we always have to, and more often than not, especially if they're established or we know, or I'm sorry, especially if they're a new patient, then they will collect up front. Okay, so like like in my what I would like to do is make my insurance percentage instead of fifty percent, make it forty percent because that typically avoids having to send statements and things. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. Right. So no, no, you're right. And then so well, it depends. I mean, it depends on uh, one great thing that my team does. They, they know every member of this community. So if somebody's longstanding, they know, oh, yeah, we know that they're going to. They're they, good uh, for it. Yeah, they're good for it. Or this is a new patient. We're not sure. Let's go and collect, you know, $500 up front for the crown. How many dentists are in your community? How many dentists? I'm not a lot. Guess. Uh, ten? Tw- uh, ten. Okay. Ten. We have a lot of specialists in our community. There's, there's ten dentists on my street corner. Yeah. <laughs> well, why do you think I bought in Whitefish Bay? I did my research. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so now we know a little bit about your practice. Now let's talk about your integration because how I know of you is through our mutual relationship with Dense Ply Serona. Uh, and, uh, uh, and well, I knew of you before from the CEREC doctors boards. So obviously you became a CEREC owner. Yeah, your practice first- wasn't already CEREC? No, my practice was an Artie Sarek. So the first thing that I invested in after, you know, saved up a little bit, the first thing I invested in was a Sarek. And that was driven by talking to my sister a lot. And she's a Sarek doctor. And she said, listen, this is going to be your, you know, you need ROI right now. So let's, you know, get us to get into a Sarek. This is where it's at. And I mean, I love it. How'd you get introduced to Sarek besides your sister? What was your buying process? Uh, My buying process is. (laughs) Did you go to any events? I went to, uh, I was flown out by Patterson to ADEC to okay. go design an ADEC office and decided there to buy a Sarah. <laughs> so it's funny because I have no ADEC chairs now in my new office, but the process started. I was thinking, okay, I'm going to eventually be looking at an office. Let's start looking at some equipment um, and just meeting with the reps and talking about it. And I get, 90% of my decision was based on seeing my sister and, and, and trying it out in her office. Okay, so you had you had some uh, validation there yeah. from a and, close, you know, somebody that you trusted. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And, you know, midwinter, I played around with it and stuff. So so got the CEREC in. Two and, and a half years now? Yeah, two and a half years now, implemented it in, hit the ground running with it, went to Scottsdale. Would you say that it's been a great investment for you? A hundred percent. I love it. It's, it's been a game changer for the way that we practice. But what, so, so, so I hear this all the time, okay? Now, listen, I hear, I'm asking this question not because I don't understand it, but for our listeners out there, when people say it's a game changer, what does that mean to you? For, it means that it's the way, forget the actual, you know, clinical 
you know, improvements that it is, but it's the way that we schedule, the way we schedule our patients, the way that everyone in this community knows that, okay, oh, you're, you know, you don't have time, go to Bayshore Dental, you'll get, you can get your crown done that same day, you don't have to come back. Um, the way we schedule our patients now, and I can, my my uh, team up front knows, if you they're scheduling an hour and a half for a CEREC, then they know at 30 minutes, at 60 minutes, we can put emergencies and things like that. So, and, and also it's, you know, I'm not seeing temporaries come off and come back and turning over chair time for re-cementing a temp, things like that. All the things that Sarah touts, it's actually one of the few times that they, the hype is, is lives up to the, the name, you know, or the, the quality lives up to it. So I do probably two to a day on average, two to three a day. So it, it's a big driving force of my practice here because we do a lot of restorative dentistry here. What all are you doing with your Sarah machine? What do you well, use it for? This is where you're going to probably call me out. No, 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 but I'm just, no, no. I mean, okay, maybe. <laughs> I am. Um, I'll tell you what I'm using it for, and I'm telling you what I'd like to use it for. I'm, I'm just using it for crowns right now. Crowns, crowns onlays. Uh, onlays, inlays, three units, bridges, uh, you know, when when. The okay, so, so just, okay, so, but hear what you just said, by the way, okay? I'm just using it for crowns. Well, also onlays, inlays, three unit bridges. I mean, that's a lot. And, and, and as a CEREC educator, I will tell you that a significant percentage of CEREC owners don't use their machine for beyond crowns and onlays alone. No, no, do you I, use Do you use it for digital impressioning? Do you send cases to connect? No, I don't. Why not? I, because I I do them here. <laughs> I mean, I, no, no, but you there's sometimes where you got to send things out anterior single units or. You're, no, you're, you're right, and like you know, my uh, my implant restorations I send out. So why don't um, you make those yourself? I because that's one of the things I want to start doing. I okay, start doing. but what's holding you back from doing that? Well, that's you know what my focus for the past year or two has been building out the new office. Okay, so that leads us into the new office. Right. So then you know after okay, got to so I so what you're saying? I'm sorry to interrupt, but what you're saying is is so what you're saying? Hey, T Bone, hold up. I know where you're going, but my focus for the last year has been building this beautiful office yeah. and it's taken all my energy and all my, you know, everything in that. So I put, essentially I'm putting my practice on growth hold exactly. from a technology and clinical hold so I can focus on this. Okay. Right. And, that, and not so much growth hold because to me, building this beautiful, thoughtful, smart, ergonomically friendly, good workflow office that's like, you know, it put a, we have some great designers that worked with me and you're know, doing that to me, that was, that was going to be built in growth right there. I mean, people, we've gotten so many patients off the street who just walked by and walked in to make an appointment. So that I, it, the growth hold wasn't there, but my own, my own skill set I put on hold. That's because, what I'm saying. Yeah. So my skill set I put on hold and, you know, keep in mind circling back to your whole theme of this is women in dentistry is that my, I only have so, so much time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, brain power in the day that I can dedicate to my new practice because I still want to be that amazing mother, that amazing daughter, that amazing wife, all that stuff. So I, I knew, that, OK, my focus for two years is going to be let's uh, find a location and gut it, remodel it, build this brand new practice, fill it with equipment that I believe in, that I love, that looks good, that's tech driven. And then once that's once that's established, then now but what I can, made you do this? What made me do this? I just I was. I grew out of my space. I mean, I... I okay. You know, so the part yeah. of it was, it wasn't, I don't want to say ego driven, but it wasn't, hey, I want this, so I'm going to do this. It was also somewhat logically driven. Yeah, it was logically driven. But, you know, I think men refer to egos, like egos more. I think women in general, we just like to be, we like to, um, you know, anything associated with us, we like it to look nice. We like to be proud of it. So, yeah, I wasn't exactly proud of my current office space and I wanted... I have a very, you know, particular taste and I wanted it to reflect that. I wanted... So what made you go crazy, basically? <laughs> well, I'll tell you. So... Did, it, did you start off wanting to be this crazy? No, I never... Oh, please, I never started. And when I say I crazy, I'm not saying what you did is crazy. I'm just saying what you did was unique. It's unique because the stars aligned for me. And I will be the first person to admit that I, if I go off and tell, if I get on my high horse telling everybody, every dentist should do what I did, it's kind of like 
Sheryl Sandberg telling every woman you need to lean in. Yeah, it's easy to lean in when you have a team of nannies taking care <laughs> of your family. And yeah, you can go be, you know, a CEO of a company. I get it. And I don't want to be that person because for me, my uh, opportunities lined up. I mean, I'm, I'm not the bread, primary bread earner of my family. So I was able to kind of invest all of my earnings into my practice because I know my spouse could take care of the family. That's one, you know, number two, it's a small community. I put a lot of feelers out there, a lot of support and from the village and stuff, helping we found a, a property that was basically poorly managed. It was going up for um, sheriff's auction, uh, almost like a short sale. So I had a lot of family support. We were able to jump on it and invest into it. And so, when you say family support, what do you mean by that? I mean that, you know, the, the amount of cash you need to have to buy a building at an auction, <laughs> basically. So in other words, you got to buy it 100%, I think, at auction. Buy it 100%. And then you can refinance it later, but you have to and you have to buy it up front. Have, okay. You have to come to the come to the closing with the cash full and full. And so most of us don't, are, you know, don't have that right away. And so um, our parents... Certainly not four or five years into practice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. For, you know, and my parents, my in-laws, and said, everyone said, hey, who wants to, you know, help me invest in this? Who building? wants to be an owner of some brick in Milwaukee? I'll give you a plaque. <laughs> and so they all, you know, the support was amazing. So I had that. We bought the building. And then, of course, back financed it and stuff. But then it was a lemon. It's a, it was a junky old building. So put in a significant amount, basically over. More than two, the building cost. Two and a half times the cost of the building we invested into gutting it. Um, and then when that process started, that's where, that's where I went crazy. Basically, I said, why, why do I, why am I going to do like laminate countertops and just do, you know, a normal, just like a regular boring dental office? Because I, I, I kind of designed this place like I was building my dream home. And I was lucky in that I got to do that. But also, it took a lot of brain, brain power and efforts. And I'm up at but it's still a risk. I mean, at the end of the day, no matter how much support you have, no matter how much, hey, my husband can support me, uh, at the end of the day, no wise father, family, husband, or wife is going to say, hey, just go blow it. <laughs> I mean, no, we're not we're not that kind of rich, you know? No, you're absolutely right. We're not, as they say, F you rich. I don't know if you can say that on a podcast. No, you can't say on my podcast, you can say anything you want. <laughs> but. So, no, you're absolutely right. You know, I mean, I'm trying to be... Just mindful that people might be. Yeah, like, oh, yeah, you want to be thoughtful and wise. I want to be thoughtful and wise, but yeah, it was a huge risk because of anything. I have to be the driving force of this. So, um, just you know, kind of a, a personality quirk is that Prague and I both we just love really good architectural design and stuff, and and fun and looking at fun stuff like that. So, like, let's turn this, and it just evolved. This practice evolved into that, and once we selected the equipment, I, I saw the Teneos at Sarek Thirty. And, and have you that, seen them before that? No, I'd never seen that. I told you, I went out to ADAC to design all, to pretty much design the office. Okay. With and then I saw, came to Sarek 30 in Vegas, saw the Teneos. I'm like, oh my gosh, these are beautiful. They're beautiful. And, you know, I mean, we, we say, we throw around integrated a lot. And yeah, you know, working with Dubs by Serona, yes, everything's integrated. But do, do we really, really know what that means? No, it just means like there's not a lot of wires everywhere. It's really, they look really nice. It's seamless. Um, there's a lot of bells and whistles on it. So I was like, yeah, this is like the Tesla of chairs. I want it. The Tesla I want it because <laughs> cause they, they look nice and they're really functional. So we kind of designed the whole office around that. I took the Teneo, the pictures of the Teneo to my architects. And I said, let's design something that will do this justice. And that was really the, the, how'd you the, get over the sticker shock of those uh, chairs? Well, you know, maybe I'm, I don't know, maybe I'm, completely delusional but i just kept on thinking well if you're not it's not like i'm buying all these expensive shoes i'm like actually <laughs> <laughs> there comes the woman comment it's not yeah. like i'm buying bags like, bags you know going around roi i'm like come on if you we have this great million dollar practice that's established in the community and yeah we're gonna have to pour a few more million into it to really build out the dream but one i'm gonna be a lot happier Two, it's going to have growth just because of the new facility. And the Three, size. And the size. And you know what? And I guess what, the reason I wasn't crazy, I didn't freak out at the sticker shock, is like I'm not afraid of hard work. I never intended to say, what, how can I cut corners and do this? I, I knew it's going to take 20, 30 years of a long career to uh, justify building this out. But I was up for it. I, I, I enjoyed the challenge. So, And, you know, Patterson does a great job of kind of sugarcoating that sticker shock, mm -hmm. don't they? <laughs> <laughs> they make it a little easy for you, Sir Serona yeah. and Patterson both do. Okay, yeah. so so you bought how many Teneos and Tegos? What did you buy? 
I bought the XG 3D cone, the 3D CT. Okay. Um, I bought, I already had the Serac, and we bought two Taneos and four Integos. So we equipped six eight, chairs. Uh, six chairs, and we have room for two more in the future. Okay. Okay, wow. All right. Mm-hmm. So, okay. So, and then you had mentioned a little bit about getting an associate. Yeah, yeah. So now that um, Bill Tobirin, the former owner, he's he retired a couple weeks ago. So this summer, uh, July, I have a new associate starting. What did he think about all of this? Oh, Going he, from he, he was uh, he loved it. I mean, you know, he calls the Taneos robots. He'll say, "I push something on." The no, robot. but I'm talking about the overall design. I mean, because maybe maybe it's a maybe me. I'd be like, I mean, what I built was so good. Why are you ruining it by making it unbelievably like a Taj Mahal? Yeah. No, he. He was, no, he got it. He got, he knew it was dated, and he said, okay. He's like, wow, I didn't think you'd go this over the top, but he got it. And here's the thing. Majority of dentists, you know, we, we like, every, we make a purchase that's based on ROI, right? That's why it's easy to invest in a Sarek or a Galileos because you see those actual numbers. and you see But, you know, ROI. so many people don't see that or understand that. But you, I, I think when you wear the private practice or a business owner hat, you you make yourself learn that because you you have to be accountable to your accountant every quarter and things like that. But but my whole thing was, and I guess the reason why I'm tagged as unique for this, I mean, this is the big reason why, you know, you've invited me on your podcast or Dense Place Serona took a big interest in me and they call me unique. And it's only because I, I built out this beautiful office that's got, you know, artistic or really fun artwork and really clean lines and upgraded, um, kind of furniture and things like that but it, it's it, to me it was like a no-brainer I said why isn't an ROI in ourselves good enough why do we you know it's saying I hear I heard a saying a lot oh you know granite countertops don't pay the bills like invest in things that will um, increase your growth so your chairs but that's a 1980s mentality exactly exactly right and the and I'm trying I want to get the word out there that you know, dentists, if you're, if you own your own practice, I mean, you can't, everything can't be about bottom line at the end of the day. Some correct. things have to be about satisfaction too. Satisfaction. I, like I told you, I'm so happy here. Our patients walk in and they're like, wow, that's satisfaction right there. And so we, we made it look nice and it reflects my personality and, and, um, so there's bubbles everywhere. There's bubbles. Yes. There's <laughs> bubbles and unicorns and rainbows. Everywhere. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. Um, no, but at the end of the day, you know, and I'll use the hotel analogy because I feel like you can relate. But, you know, I tell my pa- I tell patients or I tell business people this, you know, if you if you stay at a Four Seasons or you stay at a Holiday Inn, you're going to see a huge quality difference. Right. And of you're going to see an amenities difference. And um, from the furniture to the type of elevator, I mean, everything, the, the quality, even in wool carpet grains, there's a quality difference. Mm-hmm. You can go commercial cheap just to get the job done, or you can have everything extremely uh, boutique And so, but you're going to pay, the consumer is going to pay the difference in price. You're paying a hundred dollars a night versus $500 a night. Right. The thing is in dentistry, we don't get, there's no upcharge for a root canal. Or not a, a significant amount. Yeah. Well, no, not, you're right. Not a significant amount. Remember, I still, you know. That's $50. Dentist. I mean, at the end of the day. Exactly. It's not enough to justify what you did. So, you know, the, this, my office, my new office built out could have been done in a, probably a third of the cost than what we did it. And that was a conscious decision. And that, and it took a lot of me um, kind of lobbying for that, for that support from family and from my husband and even my team and kind of justifying every decision to everybody. And, and, you know, at the, in the beginning during or throughout the build out process, I micromanaged everything and I wanted everything to be perfect. And at, at the beginning I would apologize for, it. I'm like, I'm sorry. I know I, can you make it like this? And I was like, you know what, why am I apologizing? This You're paying my, for it. This is my life savings. This is not an investment. It's not a drop in the bucket. This is our life savings into something that's going to be a direct reflection of me and our den- and our dentistry that we provide. So there's no need to apologize for it. So if we wanted, you know, glass exit signs, we're gonna, I, I didn't want to apologize for why I wanted it. So if you want to be like Neil and have frosted doors. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know what? I mean, I, I don't have, you know, black gloves everywhere. So. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding, Neil. I love you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I didn't, I, we wanted it to be nice, but then it creeps up. Every little, little thing adds up. And before we know it, we're like, holy crap. In order That's to- why I'm not allowed to build a house. Yeah, there you go, because you're gonna want. To because my wife, when we built, built, first built our house, my wife sent me out to to, to pick uh, uh, appliances, 
And she says, I'll never send you out for anything ever again. <laughs> because I just went there and I said, I want that. I, mean, what a, I just automatically go to the right because I said, as you show me, I know the price goes up and I want that. I want that. And I mean, it's like our nature. We want, yeah. we want it good. We want it fast. We and and it. again, I go back to ego and my ego says I can, I can afford it. Even whether I can or can, I can afford it. You can afford it. And, and I think in my ego was probably saying, Hey, you know, why, why don't, why not? It's a smart investment. Don't put it in stocks. Don't put it into real estate, put it into me and then let's build this practice up and I'll make it worth your while. Kind and of so, mind. So we're going to put a link to a 3D walkthrough of your practice okay. uh, so um, so that our listeners can uh, see that. So talk to me about Conebeam. How did you, what made you buy Conebeam? I, I was in the market for a new panoramic because our old one was dying. <laughs> it was 25 years old. So um, that, and I said, I, I knew at the time, I said, I'm, I'm not just investing in a 2D I'm going to yeah. buy it, uh, pan. So let me get it. I don't even think 2d digital pans technology anymore. Yeah. It's not, it's, you're right. It's not. And the only technology is that, is that it, you know, you it's like, print it it's like pocket calculator. Is it? You're right. But it's amazing how many people still rep, like still use those. Yeah. That's your, everyday. no, I'm just, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with using them. I'm just saying, I don't consider that technology. No, you're right. You're right. And, um, but having a digital image that you can quickly email to a specialist is, is considered technology for the majority. Right. So, yeah. So I wanted to, I wanted to get into, get a cone beam so I can start doing more with it. Now, the goal is now that I've built a practice, I've got the time now, now is the time to start investing back in myself and learning okay. to use that cone beam for implant placement. I know that, you know, a certain T-bone harassed and yelled at me at the yeah. Milwaukee I Summit. wouldn't say, yeah, I didn't yell at you. I gave you a hard time. I, I with love, with disrupted love. you. It's the Indian tough love that you gave yeah, me. Yeah, well, I don't know how to, I don't know anything else for anybody. You know, I just, you know, I give people. So uh, what did you do with the cone beam? What was your buying process there? Did you go to any events or did you just blindly trust that this, well, the Serona was... I put a lot of faith into my Patterson equipment specialist, Mike, um, and because he, he, we kind of, I kind of met with him, and I said, okay, listen, I'm going to put all my trust in you, and you're going to help me design this office and pick out the right equipment, but don't screw me over and don't lead me in the wrong direction. <laughs> so I kind of give that threatening disclaimer from up front. Did you go to any summits? I, I hadn't. No, I my first three D summit was this last past week. Month. Okay, yeah, all <laughs> yeah, right. Last was my first 3D. I didn't go to any 3D summits, but I, you know, I'd gone to Scottsdale to attend um, some of the Sarek doctors' courses, and they referenced Cone Beam a lot in there, and uh, and I, I knew it, it was the right decision to make because that's where Dennis. Feeds. You know, I call Serona drug dealers, by the way. Yeah, they kind of are. <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's, but they make such beautiful stuff, man. They do. They God. do. They, they make gorgeous stuff, and it's it all matches, and you know, my cabinet trees. I just them. bought two Taneos. You did? You're going to love it. They don't, they, I don't get them in. I have to do some modifications to my suites. I'm going to make two new suites in the office. I'm going to make them. They're going to be like 15 by 15. Okay. Um, so I'm going to make them two big suites. And uh, so we got to do some construction before I can, But I'm so excited. What cabinetry are you doing? I haven't gone that far yet. I know. I just I committed to buying the chairs. Okay. Well, so. I, I mean, I would suggest, um, you know, that we, I went through the capital cabinetry through Death by Serona. Yeah, of course. And, I mean, I'll, I'll end up putting that in. It's perfect. But I'll tell you, they were awesome to work with because, you know, they, they were showing me their options and I kept on saying, and, you know, I guess the European way is you don't, they don't put anything, they don't put any side cabinets in. No. Especially not something in the nine o'clock position, the doctor position. And I said, I kept on saying, listen, I can't not do that. I need something there. And they kept on saying, well, why? What are you going to put on there? And I was like, um, Kleenex box. I mean, I was, I was very timid in saying that. But then I was like, no, you know what? This is how I practice. This is how we're trained. And so it's amazing. Um, I worked with Holger Kepler and we designed a cute little desk, like, uh, you know, that floats. It's, a, it's anchored to the wall. And it's Kapler. And he named it. We actually he named it the Mona because he designed it for my office. And now it's kind of a staple for people using their cabinetry in the U.S. for new ops with the Teneos because it's just it's so functional. I have to and, ask the Mona. Yeah, tell, tell him you want the Mona. <laughs> all right. So now let's. OK. So. All right. So what do I have left here? Are you OK on time? Perfectly fine. All right. So last, last, not, I keep saying last few things. I'm like notorious. Everything's the last few things. Okay. Okay. So now 
So timeline, I'm going to get back to the timeline, okay? Four years ago, you stopped being an associate, you bought a practice, okay? You've grown the practice, and about two years ago, you made a decision to start looking for a new building and a new everything. Yep. And about five, six months ago, you moved into this magnificent place. Thank you. And um, what, ha- what, so what impact has it had on your practice? Oh, it's... it's- it's euphoric. I mean, just patience. I'm, well, okay, so great. All the feelings aside, okay, all the women feelings aside, what what bottom line impact does it have? Bottom line impact is we've already had um, our new patients per month. Mm-hmm. We we have had a fifty percent increase in new patients per month in the past five in the past five months, purely off of our um, new office location. Location, location, location. Location, location, location. Social media presence, presence showing the new office, things like that. So who's so, doing that for you, the social media presence? Um, I, I have a good friend of mine who he he does he does that for me. But I basically, I manage about 80% of it. So I put it out there because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fun thing for me. It's not one of those things where I'm micromanaging. It's fun. We make fun videos and stuff. And um, he'll, he'll edit them and guide them and it'll put them up. But we'll, I'll send him some content for it. Okay. I, that's about the extent of the marketing that we're doing is just putting fun things up on social media. And okay. All right. That's fair. All right. So let's talk about, uh, so you're doing some speaking as well now. How did yeah. you get into that? Well, you know what? And that's, I think it's, it's fun because women, um, I, mean, I took up half your time down in Orlando, just so you know, yeah, you, did, you did. And I yelled at you for that because that was my very first public speaking talk as, you know, as a dentist and, and you ate up half my time and I had all my cards and bullet points ready. But, and I, I didn't like, even know. I just started talking and, and nobody, they finally cut the microphone off. <laughs> and then I just, you know what? I just threw the cards and I was like, you know what? Screw this. I'm just going up there and talking. Because yeah. <laughs> See, I, I helped you out. You did. You did. And then, yeah, it was, it was great, but no, you were, you're such a great dynamic speaker. And it was, it was fun to like watch you and then go up there and say, okay, let me tell you my story. And, um, Basically, Dense by Serona approached me and they said, you know, you're a unique situation. We built, um, if not the first, but one of the first all Dense by Serona offices in the U.S. Because every equipment, every all the cabinetry, everything uh, was Dense by Serona. So they they kind of love that. And uh, of course, and um, it was as financial investment aside, I was very... I guess transparent and I was very we put we posted a ton of videos and drone footage and all this fun stuff all the fun millennial stuff yeah I saw you there was like videos of the whole place being built over time lapse yeah well that's the thing you make best friends with somebody who's a total geek with a drone and then you just tell them here I'll here I'll buy you some Starbucks can you I ever tell you my drone story no so we uh I was getting filmed for uh, a a speaker profile and the person who came to film me had a uh, drone and I thought that was the coolest thing ever. So I went on Amazon and bought one next day air. And it came to my house. I hit, My guy said, listen, you need to watch the videos on how to set this thing up. And of course, I didn't read any manuals or watch any videos. I put everything together, turned it on. And in my house, this thing started flying around. So I stuck my hands out there to grab it. And it chopped up my hand. Oh, my God. <laughs> Oh, you sound just like another Indian man that I know very well, like my husband who <laughs> bought a drone on Amazon when he saw it, got it, didn't read it, and flew it outside and crashed the propellers on his very first maiden voyage. So, yeah, I can see, we're all the same. <laughs> what is it with you guys and you don't read instructions? Just we, we, listen, why should we, when we are the ones that write the instructions and code everything, why in the world should, should we, that stuff's just I'm, innate something there my friend you know what there's girls who code now so no i'm not talking about guys i'm just saying indians in general yeah, this is true yeah the indians in general yeah that's true one of our cousins probably wrote the drone code so okay so you're speaking how much speaking are you yeah. doing so now you know a little bit here and there not as much um i'm getting more in- involved into it i've been working with them by serona and i think the i think for them they, maybe they see that it, i'm a little bit unique and that um i'm female and while i don't i honestly i don't love playing the female card on things. It's the reality of it is that, yeah, I'm a female and a mother of two children. And yet um, I kind of prioritize investing into my practice and wanting to learn. And, and I think they are, they're excited to kind of have me share that journey with everyday dentists out there. 52% of dentists out there are females now, but yet how many graduating, graduating, how many female speakers or CE leaders in their community or, you know, no, not, not, not 52%. 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, all these all these amazing blogs that I follow and websites, you know, Digital Enamel, yours, um, Sam Corey's, all these, they're amazing, but you don't see a lot of females in that giving their perspective on it. So I think that um, maybe that's a, a unique niche where I can bring in some perspective. It's, it's, I'm a very what you see is what you get person. And, um, you know, I can share some of my successes and, you know, in my own private office, in my office, I have a whole little area for the kids that I built that they can do their homework and play their Legos. There's literally a whole pile of Legos on the floor of my office right now. I went to Legoland last week. Yeah, I saw that. (laughs) Pretty cool. In your orange hat. It was awesome. (laughs) So let me ask you this. So how, so what is your goal with the speaking? Do you want to speak every week? Do you want to speak once a month? What is your vision for that? Well, again, I mean, I, I'm very cognizant of work-life balance. So I would, I don't have an, a definitive number, but maybe, you know, three, four, five times a year um, speaking and kind of just being relatable to people that aren't as, I'll tell three, you. Three, four, five times a year? That's hardly at all. No, I mean, that's, I think that, that's, that's. That's like month. a month. That's what, you know, yeah, maybe every couple of months. <laughs> okay. Hey, I could maybe start a podcast like yours. And you I should. You talk a lot. Call. You could. Yeah. But you know what? And this is coming from someone who's attended, you know, watched you speak a few times, things like that. You and a lot of the powerhouse speakers out there are amazing, dynamic personalities. And you guys are incredibly inspiring because you share your own stories and how you've implemented so much growth in your practice, you know, with you with the sleep and things like that. But How much does that pay into your role of buying all this stuff? It's well, it's well, first of all, it's very intimidating because I guess I I don't know if it's because I'm female or if it's because I'm um, a little bit a few years younger or who knows. But I don't I get very intimidated about doing all of that. So I'm hoping that me kind of sharing some of my stories about the decision making I'm doing maybe can relate to the quote unquote more everyday dentist. And I know that you guys are trying to do that too. And in some ways you yeah, are. Yeah, but at some point we lose touch with reality a little bit. You do a little or bit. The perception, or the perception is is that we're not, like how about this? I take way more insurances than you do, yeah. right? You know, my practice is probably truthfully more everyday than yours in the sense that I would say 80% of my practice is PPOs and 20% isn't. Uh, mm-hmm. So, um, but yeah, but the perception or the rea- the perception is is that we have these practices that are, different and they're not but yeah they're not I mean I and in in this uh, work-life balance I would love to dedicate 10 hours a week to a person my own personal time to CE whether it's just sitting down and reading or like implementing um uh, in, uh, better manuals. I was, you know, I was listening to you and Mina Barsoon talking about, he, he's got some pretty good uh, regimented manuals or protocols in his office. And you're like, take a half a day off to implement a new uh, home sleep study manual into your office. I mean, yeah, I would love to do that kind of stuff. But the reality is I'm burning the candle at both ends. And so you don't dedicate that time. And I think that that's what your everyday dentist is. Not so much that I'm a PPO office, but it's more like, I have two kids and I'm, you know. They're not 100% committed like somebody like me is. Yes. Like I I live, eat, and breathe this stuff. Yes, and my husband lives, eats, and breathes his career. And so, and there's no shame in that. That makes you guys amazing clinicians and amazing business people. But I don't have the luxury, or right now, I don't have yet. You know, you always say we want more time, money, or satisfaction, right? I'm incredibly satisfied at this moment because I'm still riding this high from this new office, but that's going to wear off soon, and I'm going to want to yeah. implement. A year from now, that'll wear off. Yeah, implant, sleep apnea, and all that. And I can do that slowly. And the money, I, I'm not, you know, I, the money is always, yeah, everyone wants more money, but really, for me, it's the time. I just want to be able to... And maybe this is a, a, a female thing, or but you know we want to be the Pinterest mom. We want to be able to send the, the right homemade treats with our kids to school, and not just buy a box of brownies on our way home from a podcast at nine o'clock at night. You know, which is <laughs> what I'm going to be doing tonight because she needs to take treats tomorrow. So. Well, maybe your husband uh, bake something. Uh, yeah, sure. He probably, the house will be on fire. He, he probably lined up a bunch of protein bars. <laughs> but here you go. <laughs> but, you know, it's that mom guilt. And I'm sure that, I know that there's people out there, probably the dad guilt. But we, if I dedicate the more hours I'm dedicating to in having my own growth in my practice, as far as starting to place implants and educating myself and training to do that, or integrating home sleep studies and doing sleep apnea, then that's less time that I am um, with my other responsibilities. And that's the personal choice that I make. So there's a But I think getting your associate will help you with that. Absolutely. That's a huge driving force. I want him to come in and basically do the run of the mill. And this is exactly what you talk about. And it's very inspiring. I want him to uh, be able to eat up what eats up my day, which a lot of restorative 
Um, that like, I don't I, think you should be doing fillings and crowns anymore. I would absolutely love to be able to, a year from now, us talk and say, yeah, he does all the fillings and crowns and I'm able to focus on... Whatever um, it is you want to focus on. Whatever it is, the implant or the sleep or the TMJ. I Things see a like second that. associate in the future. We're trying to hire a second associate right now. That's all. Good for you. That's, that's amazing. I mean, we're hiring a new associate and a new hygienist. And How's that search going for the associate? Oh, it's wonderful. It's done. Oh, you, oh, you already found somebody. I found someone and he's starting in July. And uh, to Patterson Dental's credit, they were, they actually I have a great relationship with my local Patterson team here and they vetted him and they're, they said um, for over six months now, we have the perfect person for your office. We know you now, we know your philosophy, we know what you want to do. And so they really helped me search. But it's, um, I, I uh, he's a fresh graduate and a lot of people are kind of saying, well, that's a little risky, don't you think? But, you know, I, I'm up for the challenge. I'm you were a fresh the- graduate once. Exactly. We all needed a job once. And I'm up for taking him under our wing here and saying, hey, this is kind of how we do. Our practice is, I mean, maybe not unique, but it's it's one of those, it's, it's boutique-ier in that our patients, we spend so much time chatting with them. Uh, you go, I can't go to the grocery store down the street without bumping into five patients and spend half an hour there talking. So it's a very community-based, small town, everyone helps each other out kind of thing. And I love that. But it also comes with this higher expectation that we know everything about them and we and um, we'll drop everything to take care of them and things like that. And that's perfectly fine with me. I like that mentality. So I need to kind of season my new associate to get into that mentality. But it'd be great if he can take on some of the run of the mill dentistry, the restorative and the crowns. And I can focus on some of uh, just set the expectations up front. That that would be my number one advice to you on that with associates. I, I've struggled. I finally got a I finally got a great one right now. I mean, I told him today that I felt uh, I felt blessed, and I'm not a religious person. That that he's in my life, and he's really allowed me to to do some different things, which is great. I mean, you look at you. You're, and I think people take it probably for granted that you you have this dental practice that you can come in and get a two surface resin done you know because we think of you we think of t-bone and you're doing all this education and and sleep and implants and all this stuff and uh you're able to do that because you do have this great team and associate that can do that and you have a very supporting mona at home yes. that can do with that. so yeah I, i'm hoping with you know speaking a little bit more and getting out there one i, I get to show off my beautiful office we're really proud of it and, and you should be i mean it's fantastic but I want people to know that it's not just, oh, pretty colors and, and cool furniture. It's it's a lot of thought into the flow. And, you know, my sterilization is completely in the open in the middle of the office and because I wanted that transparency for patients to see that. And a lot of kind of the decisions why we chose what we did and um, in that it's, you know, I guess my takeaway message would be that in, in building out an office and spending double your budget on your own office, yes, you have to be in a fortunate place to do that, uh, to be able to do that or have a convince a bank to finance that. But it shouldn't be, you should still understand there's an ROI there. There is an ROI because you're personally so fulfilled and your patients are going to see that. And why not create an environment that reflects who you are? I mean, it, it's amazing how... I mean, it's worked out financially for you, even beyond the fact that you were in a position to get some help with it. It turns out that you didn't need the help. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. You're right. And it, uh, we could have financed it 100%, but um, it, it's worked out. It's a long-term payoff plan, which I'm prepared for that. But why not be proud of what you, you know, we, we in general... We want to, women, we want to be proud of what reflects our home. Our, my dental practice is my second home. and Maybe a primary home tonight. There are times, <laughs> my, maybe tonight. After I go pick up the brownies, I'll just come back here. Now you can do drive through I think uh, Taco Bell sells Choco Tacos. Oh, my gosh. You know what? Hey, I, I told you. I, I at least once a day text my husband, hashtag mom of the yeah. year, because there's something I've forgotten or, you know, I didn't make it to right on time or showed up to in scrubs or things like that. But you know what? I mean, the, we're trying to teach our girls, hey, it, it, you have two working parents. We're working hard. We're following our dream. And as cheesy as that is, it's, it's important. And How do people get in touch with you, Mona? Um, easily. They can get in touch with me to my email. You can email me at Mona Patel, DDS at gmail.com. You can 
Um, get in touch me on touch with me on Facebook, Mona Goyle Patel, or at Bayshore Dental. Our office is Bayshore Dental in Whitefish Bay, uh, and the office phone number is 414-332-6010. But this day and age, just go to our website, Bayshore. Do, mo- do you allow people to come in that uh, and look at your office and see what you've built and how you've designed it? All the time, all the time, at least once a day, somebody's walking through this office. So my my team doesn't always love this, but I tell them we have to, this office is always on its A game and show ready and, and, and that's just my own mentality. That's how I like to keep things like everything in its place and a place for everything. So we have people coming in all the time. I mean I'm I'm incredibly proud of this office and without sounding egotistical, I mean a lot of work, a lot of effort, a lot of nights up late on my laptop looking at Pinterest um, and a lot of creativity went into this office. Like our artwork, some of our uh, artwork on the walls, I have these fingerprints of my daughters, these huge CAD CAM stylized fingerprints and they're and it's like is that what that is behind you I thought those were eyeballs look these are two they're two fingerprints of your daughter of my two of each daughter oh that's awesome started with a joke when we were talking about the how the white walls I said well my daughters are going to fingerprint everything up anyway and so they took three layers of black gray and white plywood combined it together CAD CAM stylized milled it onto this and it's a kind of a, like a homage to dentistry on the materials that we use so it's pretty it's pretty um cool we're proud of those stories so i love to show it off and tell people not to be egotistical about it to, but to be maybe to inspire somebody you know i'm not quite not quite at the place where you know when we hear you speak you inspire us to like say hey implement sleep apnea evaluation into your office and things like that you know those are not my niches yet but my niches are smart um, office design and ergonomic office design and, and kind of put a little bit of your personality in your office and you'll, you'll be surprised what that ROI is. And it's not a tangible ROI, but there's nothing wrong with it being a emotional ROI. Well, it's part of that satisfaction. Mona, I feel bad. I've kept you very, very late. You're fine. You, this was, I dedicated my evening to you, Tim. Oh, but like, see, I, I, now if I can get another Mona to dedicate her <laughs> evening to me, that would be nice. You know what? Hey, every, Indian women are usually nice to every single Indian man except their own husband. <laughs> Pretty well, I can I can vouch for that. Thank you, uh, thank you for for including me in here, and I, you know I'd love for people to um, come and chat with me anytime, or if they want to show me their office plans and and pick my brain on stuff. I've made a lot of mistakes, and you know I wish certain things with HVAC plans or acoustics or things like that. I wish I could go back and change. So I'm happy to talk to people out there about um office design or just women in dentistry and kind of getting getting uh, the word out there that women need to be more in in more leadership roles actually that's awesome uh so uh, again thank you very much for listening everybody i want to to take an opportunity to meet uh, dr patel dr mona and uh, uh she is fantastic she has an unbelievably bright future within our profession and I think she represents a good good way of moving forward. Uh, despite that, we're both Serona fanboy fan people. Uh, I think it's beyond that. I think you know substitute whatever X Y Z brand uh, that you want to use in this. Whether it you know whatever brand you want to use, it's about building, having a passion, building, a, chasing a dream, uh, designing what makes you happy, and making wise and logical decisions along the way. And I I would say to me uh, the biggest thing that I I've heard here from me is uh is location 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 it makes a big difference to be in in the right spot uh, so again uh, if you guys could do me a couple of favors if you could leave us some reviews on itunes and share uh, these episodes with other uh, practitioners that would be unbelievably wonderful until next week uh see you then thanks so much for listening to t-bone speaks with dr tarun agarwal Remember to keep striving for excellence and we'll catch you on the next episode.